using sort of the same principle that we look at with the girdles, right? So the hip bone or the hip or pelvic girdle is anchoring the rest of the skeleton, starting with the femur to the axial skeleton. It's also going to function to support locomotion or movement and then balance, really important for keeping us upright, maintaining our balance, allowing certain aspects of our gait, etc. Now we have several different regions in terms of dividing the limb. We've got the pelvic girdle, which has several different parts. We have the thigh bone, which is the femur. We have the leg. And usually in layman's, we consider the leg the entire limb. So if you tell someone you have pain in the leg, they'll ask you where, right? The anatomical view is the leg starts at the knee. So the leg is specifically from the knee joint to the ankle joint and not the entire limb as we kind of say it in layman's terms. Um, the ankle is gonna be the joint between the uh, leg bones and the foot. And then the foot will obviously be similar uh, makeup of tarsal bones, metatarsals, and phalanges articulated together. So let's look at these individually and look at some of their features. Um, the pelvic girdle. So the pelvic girdle is the hip bone essentially, sometimes called the ox coxae or the coxal bones. They articulate anteriorly together and are um, sort of fused in place by a large wedge of cartilage called the pubic symphysis. This is a, part, a, a piece of a fibrous cartilage. Um, and then posteriorly, they articulate with the sacrum of the vertebral column. So notice how they're directly anchored to the axial skeleton by way of the sacrum to the ilium. Um, we wanna think about the parts of the hip bone. So the hip bone actually is a fused bone that has three separate parts. The ilium being the top part of that bone, the largest portion. This creates landmarks like our iliac crest, our hips, right? Those surface landmarks on the body. And then the lower, smaller portions are gonna be the pubis, which is inferior and anterior, and the ischium, which is inferior and posterior, right? So you're kind of sitting on your ischium when you're taking a seated position. So the ilium, ischium, pubis, and fused together to form that one single pelvic bone or hip bone. And on that basis, you wanna think about some of the shared features. So some of these features are found not in any one of these, but they are found in the point where all three of these bones meet. That is the acetabulum. The acetabulum is synonymous with the glenoid cavity. It is the socket that forms the ball and socket joint at this girdle. So the ball being the head of the femur articulates in the socket, which is the acetabulum. Other important landmarks that are shared are the greater sciatic notch. Greater sciatic notch is a large, deep sort of, um, you know, curve or um, depression rather that is found and shared between the ilium and the ischium. And then the obturator foramen is this opening that is found anteriorly between the pubis and the ischium. So these are some of the shared features that are not, again, found in any one bone, but kind of shared across a few. And I want to point out the obturator foramen is eventually going to be covered with muscles, the obturator muscle namely, and that is going to create the obturator um, our groove, which is where we have certain vessels and nerves passing through. So this is going to, this isn't going to maintain open the way that it is in the body. It's actually going to be covered up with muscles. Similarly, with the greater sciatic uh, notch, that is going to be covered up by ligaments to form the greater sciatic foramen. Let's look at the ilium separately and look at its unique features. First off, we have the iliac press this smooth curved projection at the top of the bone. Again, this is kind of where we have the inlet to the pelvis. This forms the ridge or crest of the pelvis. Uh, anteriorly, we have two spinous projections, the anterior superior iliac spine and the anterior inferior iliac spine. So the anterior superior iliac spine specifically is a surface landmark. If you're you know, particularly thin, you can palpate that on yourself as that bony landmark marking the uh, inlet to the pelvis. And the anterior inferior iliac spine is going to be lower and not as palpable. Um, we also have the iliac fossa. 
So within the internal aspect of the iliac bone going down into the pelvic inlet, we have this smooth um, surface, which is the iliac fossa. It's going to be the location of the iliacus muscle, which lays or sits in this um, space. Let's look at a posterior view of the ilium. So again, this is sort of a back view. We're gonna have two spinous projections here, the posterior uh, superior iliac spine and the posterior inferior, or is it posterior inferior iliac spine. So the, the, the lead for this is missing, but they should be going here. So posterior superior and posterior inferior iliac spine. And so these are going to be the opposite projections as these two. So anterior, superior, and inferior iliac spinous, spines, and then posterior projections here. Um, we talk about the iliac crest, we talk about the iliac fossa, and then we also have um, the ischia. So because we're looking at a more posterior view, we're going to see the greater sciatic notch, and then the articulation where we go from the ilium down to the ischium posterior. A lateral view of the ilium. Okay, we're gonna see those same four projections that we looked at, anterior superior, anterior inferior, posterior superior, posterior inferior. We're also going to see iliac crest. Now we can't see iliac fossa because iliac fossa is on the internal aspect of this bone and we're looking at a lateral view of this bone. But we can see the acetabulum and we can see the obturator foramen, which are shared. Moving down to the ischium. So the ischium is your um, kind of your posterior bones um, or posterior gluteal bones, if you will. These have the ischial spine and the ischial spine is a spinous projection that separates the greater sciatic notch from the lesser sciatic notch. Now, the only difference is greater sciatic notch is shared between ilium and ischium. Lesser sciatic notch is only as a feature only of the ischium, so it's not a shared feature. But both of these become important passageways for a lot of the nervous structures, like the sciatic nerve, a lot of our other lumbar sacral nerves, and some of the important vessels that go down to supply the neck. Um, when we look at the tuberosity, the ischial tuberosity, so this is the specific projection that you sit on. So as you're in a seated position, this is the landmark that is actually touching your chair. Ischial tuberosity is kind of what you sit on when you're in a seated position. And then the ischial ramus. A ramus is really a strip of connecting bone. All right. And we'll, we talked about other rami, like the ramus of the mandible, kind of that wedge of connection um, at the angle of the mandible. Similarly, the ischial ramus is the strip of connection um, that is found creating the obturator foramen, but specifically the part formed by the ischium. We're also going to talk about the pubic ramus, which is the strip of connection that is forming the obturator foramen, but is formed by the pubic bone. So this specific part would be the ischial ramus. Let's look at some of the pubic uh, or pubis um, bone features, right? Pubic features. So here we have the superior pubic ramus. Again, the strips of bone that come together to form this opening are called the rami. We have a superior pubic ramus and then an inferior pubic ramus. And then we just look at the ischial ramus all together forming the um, sort of the outline of the obturator front. We also have the symphyseal surface. This is the surface where both pubic symphyses articulate together at that fibrocartilage joint, and that forms the pubic symphysis. So the symphyseal surface is the bony surface. The pubic symphysis is really the cartilage wedge that articulates these two halves of the pubic bone together um, to form that secure joint. And the pubic symphysis is a very, very secure joint. It's one of our um, strongest joints in the body, apart from the sternoclavicular joint, which is our second um, you know, very strong, very secure joint. Pubic symphysis is going to be the next in that list. It's very strong. It's a fibrous joint as opposed to a cartilaginous joint. So it doesn't allow as much flexibility as um, other joints. Um, this is why in things like um, 
arrested labor, for example, if a woman goes into labor and it's arrested and there needs to be more flexibility to allow that fetus to maneuver through the birth canal, we end up having to fracture this bone, fracture this joint, which is a really, um, a more older technique. I don't think we do it as much now, uh, but fracture this joint just to tell you how, you know, secure, how hard, how, um, you know, um, how strong this joint is instead of allowing it to move, which we would do at other joints. So just an interesting tidbit about that pubic symphysis. Let's look at the leg, um, the rest of the limb and the bones and features, starting with the femur. The femur is the longest bone in your body. It's the longest, biggest bone in your body. And it is one continuous bone, right? It has a head and neck at the proximal end, head articulating into the acetab uh, acetabulum of the hip bone. And then neck here, we don't have the two descriptions for the neck that we see with the humerus. We have one neck being the narrowed part right distal to the head. Now we have two projections here, kind of like what we saw with the humerus as well. We have a greater trochanter at the lateral edge and a lesser trochanter at the medial edge, okay? And you don't want to confuse the trochanters with their tubercles or tuberosities, okay? Trochanters are of the femur, um, tuberosities or tubercles are of the humerus, okay? So greater trochanter and lesser trochanter are also going to be the attachment for a lot of our hip and gluteal muscles. And we'll talk about those in week five when we get the lower limb. Other features that we can see are the, um, the phobia. Okay, phobia is not on our list. All right, so we have head, neck, greater trochanter, lesser trochanter. Now, this is going to be more of an anterior view. So at an anterior view, we're going to see that the greater trochanter and lesser trochanter are connected by a line. On a posterior view, greater trochanter and lesser trochanter are connected by this depression. It's called a crest. So the anterior connection is the intertrochanteric crest. Posterior connection is the intertrochanteric, um, excuse me, intertrochanteric line anteriorly and intertrochanteric crest posterior. Continuing on to the rest of the femur, we have the shaft of the femur, again, the long, um, central elongated part of the bone. Um, and this being our longest bone, it's going to have a very long shaft. The distal end, we're going to find our condyles. Again, we talk about the definition of a condyle, a cartilage lined surface. Now, the cartilage lined surfaces of the femur are not uniquely named. We just have the medial condyle and the lateral condyle, which are going to articulate um, to the tibia as well as. Uh, have a surface for the patella. So the patella surface is going to be this depression anteriorly uh, on the condylar surfaces where the patella will be located. Looking at the patella itself, the patella is a small rounded uh, sesamoid bone, sesamoid meaning that it is enveloped within a tendon. It doesn't actually directly articulate, but it is found invested within the patella tendon. It has a base towards the top, which is larger, more wider, or more wide. And then it has an apex towards the bottom, which is more narrow um, and, and somewhat, somewhat more pointed. Okay, This is an anterior view. So this is what you would see looking head on at someone's kneecap, for example. And then if you flip it around and look at the inner surface, you'd find the articular surfaces that are, are attached or articulate with the patella surface of the femur. Let's keep going, moving down and look at some of the leg bones. So the tibia and the fibula form the leg bones. The tibia being the more medial, the fibula being the more lateral. And we have some landmarks here as well. So the medial condyle is going to be the medial cartilage lined surface of the tibia. And then lateral condyle is going to be the lateral cartilage lined surface of the tibia. I'm just going to move this out of the way. So here's the lateral condyle, and then here's the medial condyle, right? We also have the intercondylar eminence. So because we have both of these condyles, we have this sort of groove uh, or projection in between those condyle, 
condyle line surfaces. And so that is called the intercondylar eminence. It is also going to be the attachment for some of our ligaments that secure the knee joint, like the anterior cruciate ligament, the ACL, and the posterior cruciate ligament, the PCL, and the menisci, et cetera. So the intercondylar eminence is gonna really help to secure the knee joint and some of the ligaments that reinforce those bony connections. Um, we also have the tibial tuberosity. Tibial tuberosity is a roughened projection anterior on the tibia, which is the attachment for the patella tendon. So the patella tendon runs over top the knee joint. It is going to envelope the patella and then the tendon is gonna insert here on the tibial tuberosity. And then if you look at the distal end of the tibia on the medial, because the tibia is the medial bone, we're gonna find the medial malleolus at the ankle, which is a rounded, sort of a ball-like projection that you can palpate on yourself, right? That medial malleolus. Similarly, we have a lateral malleolus. This is found on the fibula instead. So this is kind of like what we saw with the styloid processes. There's a medial one on the ulna and a lateral one on the radius. Similarly here, there's a lateral malleolus on the fibula and a medial malleolus that is on the tibia. And these act in a similar way as the styloid processes do. They anchor the tarsal bones and secure them at the ankle joint. We also have the head of the fibula, which importantly does not articulate at the knee joint. So at the knee joint here, we only have the femur, the tibia, and the patella. The fibula actually sits underneath the head of the tibia. So it does not directly articulate to form the knee joint, unlike what we see at the elbow. At the elbow, all three joints make the elbow joint, right? The humerus, the radius, and ulna. But here, the anatomy is slightly different. Only the tibia and femur uh, make the knee joint. Let's shift gears, look at the foot and some of the foot bones, starting with the tarsals. And these are synonymous with the carpals, right? Tarsals of the foot, carpals of the hand. Now, the tarsals are also uniquely named and uniquely positioned. Uh, it is more important for you to know where the position of these bones are just because they're larger and they have uh, more unique projections or unique features. Starting with the talus. So the talus is gonna be the superior bone it's going to be um, found articulating with the leg bones, right? The fibula and the tibia to form the ankle joint. So specifically the tibia to the talus forms the ankle joint. Um, and then that will be secured at the ankle. Now, inferiorly, we have the calcaneus. The calcaneus is the heel bone. That's kind of what you're walking on or standing on. And it is the largest of the tarsal bones. Anterior to that row, we have the navicular. Navicular here, kind of shaped like a ship, hence the term navicular. This kind of curved projection sitting at the talus. And then anterior to the navicular, we have three bones that are named together in a group. We have the medial cuneiform, the intermediate cuneiform, and the lateral cuneiform together forming the three medial bones, uh, three medial and anterior bones of the parcels. And the last bone being the lateral most bone, the cuboid bone, which is sort of shaped in like a cube, right? So talus, calcaneus, navicular, medial, intermediate, and lateral cuneiform, and then the cuboid being the last in that row, okay? And then a nice mnemonic here that can help you remember these, again, in their order, is tall Californian Navy medical interns, medical interns being intermediate, like being lateral cuneiform, and then cuties, okay? Tall Californian Navy medical interns, like cuties. Now this one is not as catchy, as easy to remember, um, but you may be able to come up with your own. It is more important for you to know the location and position of these, as well as their individual names. Um, so you should pay a little bit more attention to that as opposed to the carpals. Lastly, let's talk about the metacar metatarsals and the phalanges. Similar sort of orientation as the 
and the metatarsals are going to form the flat of the foot, right? Or the um, the plantar surface of the foot, the uh, flat surface of the foot. And that is going to be, again, named according to the first digit, second digit, all the way through to the fifth. Then we have the phalanges, 14 of them. We have a proximal row, one through five. We have a intermediate row. Remember, the intermediate or middle row only has two through four. So there is no first middle phalange, neither in the hand nor in the foot. And then the distal phalange, one through five, are going to be the smallest um, of the bones in and the most distal in terms of the location. Okay. All right, any questions? Let's go into some more practice questions.